you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 4. And um, by way of introduction, um, the Gospel of Luke is written by Luke, who we believe was a physician. And that's part one. Uh, And then the same Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And that's part two. And uh, it was originally written that they might be read side by side. You could see the things that Jesus began to do. And then you read the book of Acts, you, you begin to see the things that the Holy Spirit began to do through uh, the disciples. And so they're meant to read to be read together. And what I want to do this morning is uh, really hone in on Acts chapter four. But I want to look at it through a different lens. And that lens is going to be uh, the transformation of the apostle Peter. I want to make a case to you this morning that the resurrection of Jesus really does change everything, beginning with God's people. So um, a couple years ago, I went to the doctor and uh, my numbers were not up to his standard. And he basically told me, you're not taking care of yourself and I need you to uh, make some changes in your lifestyle. And um, so we heeded that and we, uh, I, uh, found the home gym community. And uh, my wife has been really supportive. And just there are people out there who do gyms at their home. And so we took the plunge and we bought bikes and rowers and all this other stuff. And to be honest with you, um, I don't always love steady state cardio where I just sort of get on a bike and I just ride for 45 minutes or get on a rower and row for 45 minutes, um, but I have to do it. Um, and I, I can't work out to music. Like that doesn't pump me up. Like it doesn't get me excited. What I need is a TV show. I'm just, I'm just being really honest. I'm being really honest. So if I work out on Monday mornings, I'll usually watch a sermon and I'll watch a sermon while I work out. If it's On a Tuesday where I'm going to be in the office pretty late, I'll go in around 10 and I'll watch First Take or Sports Center while I'm on uh, the bike. If if, if it's a late night workout, then I want to watch some basketball or football. I I have to have the TV going. And um, and when I can't watch any of those, I love to watch the show Love It or List It. (laughs) I see some heads shaking. I see some I, I hear a clap in the back. And in case you, who's not watched Love It or List It? Raise your hand if you have not watched the show. All right, y'all track it with me then. So here's the premise of the show for those of you who have not seen it. Usually it's a couple and they, they, they need to get a new house and they have to decide if they're gonna love their current house by letting someone renovate it or if they're gonna list it and go buy something new. And so it always begins, this woman and this man, they show up, and the woman is like the eternal optimist. She specializes in renovating what is old. I mean, she says, look, 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 I I can fix those sagging floors. I can move that wall out of the way. I can open up this space. I can put new countertops. She's the eternal optimist. But then she has a counterpart who's a man, and he's the eternal pessimist. He's the antagonist. You don't need this old house. It floods, the foundation is messed up. Look at the paint color. He's pointing out everything wrong with it because he wants them to buy a new house. And so as, as I'm rowing, I'm row, I, I, my mind is like, please stay in your house. Please don't sell your house. Please let it be transformed. And I think I, I meant that way because that's my hope. I hope that God is going to be transforming me and identifying those areas in my life that are not pleasing to him, those areas where I fall short, and he's going to transform that. I also think that's the story of the gospel. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God did not discard this earth. He does not discard them. He said, no, I'm going to carry out my redemption right here on this planet through you humans. I'm not going to start over. And... um, I love transformation. I love to see old things being made new. And that's what the resurrection is about. It's about the God 
who is going to take old people and make us new. And one of the primary ways that God's going to do that is through the resurrection of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit who comes upon us, who changes us. That's what Easter really is about. It's about God changing everything. And so this morning, I want to look at Peter, and we're going to look at Peter in Luke 22, but I want to hone in on Peter here in Acts 4 and really work through this question of who was this old Peter? And what do we see now in this text that's new? And then what caused the transformation and the change? So read with me. Acts chapter 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. They were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested Peter and John and they put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. And on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and the elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were the uneducated, common men. They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this we cannot deny. But in order that it may be spread no further among the people, let us warn them not to speak any more of anyone in his name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you, rather than to God, you must be our judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you convert and build up your people. Uh, as Barry reminds us through the regular reading of the word, but especially the preaching thereof. Father, use your servant right now to transform your people. I pray this for the glory of Jesus. We pray. Amen. Let's, look at, let, let's consider the old Peter. We're, we're going to get here, but I, I do think that Luke, who also wrote the book of Acts, he's giving us some pointers that really demand that we not read this out of context, that we actually take a moment to think about this same Peter who over in Luke um, just made a mess of his life. So here's what we know from the book of Luke from a historical standpoint. We know that Jesus's earthly ministry began around the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. We also know that Pontius Pilate was governor and that this was during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. And you'll notice that Luke 3, that's, that, that's the phrase there. And you see the names here again in verse 6 with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas. And so what, what, what Luke is doing is saying, hey, Luke and Acts, they're meant to be read together. Now, those names are important. You remember Pilate because Pilate is who, who handed Jesus over to be crucified. Annas was the high priest from A.D. 6 to A.D. 15. He was deposed by Rome. And then his son-in-law, 
who, who is Caiaphas, became the high priest. And so that's why Annas is called the high priest here in, chapter, in verse 6, but he's really not the acting high priest. It's much like president in our day. If you're a president, you're always a president. You're always president so-and-so, even if you're not in office. And so these are the men here. These are the men who were in office when Jesus' ministry began. And so he orients us around uh, when these things take place. But what, what's happening leading up to Luke 22? We looked at it last week in Jesus' triumphal entry. Jesus rides in on a donkey. He proves himself to be the anointed king. And then he turns to Judas and says, you're going to betray me. And you're going to uh, hand me over. And then that happens. And he turns to Peter. He says, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter says, oh, no, Lord, I will not. I'm ready to go to prison with you. I'm even ready to die for you. And that's what uh, Wilson read this morning. And then you know how that played out. Judas really did betray Jesus. And Peter, when Judas betrayed Jesus, um, a servant of the high priest. Remember that the high priest here had a servant and that servant came to arrest Jesus. And one of Jesus's followers pulled out a sword and cut the ear off. Now, what servant did that? Peter did that. So track with what Luke is doing in Luke 22. It's that Peter. What also happened after that when Jesus was taken? Guess where Jesus was taken? He was taken into the palace of the high priest. And while he went into the palace of the high priest, Peter followed and someone made a fire in the courtyard. And it says the high priest's servant girl saw Peter around the fire, and she says, you're one of them. Peter says, no, I'm not. He denied him once. Someone else says, you're one of them. No, I'm not. Denied him twice. You're one of them. No, I'm not. And Luke tells us that as soon as Peter denied Jesus the third time in Luke 22, the rooster crowed. But Luke adds something else. He said that when Peter did that, Jesus locked eyes with him. And Peter wept bitterly and went out into the night. That's Peter. Beloved, if you, if Peter were a house on love it or leave it, do you know what kind of home he'd be? It would present well. You'd have the greatest copy. It would have the greatest photographs of the outside on the MLS, but once you got inside of that house, it would stink, stink of sin. In one room, there is pride. In another room, there is idolatry. In another room, there is this quickness to pick up a sword and to usher in the kingdom of God by force. In another room, he's over-talking and over-promising and under-delivering. In another room, you would see his idolatry of comfort. In another room, you'd see that, brother, you're a liar, and here is the truth of the gospel. That's true for all of us. We all present more than who we really are. When the Holy Spirit does his work, he begins to show us that lurking in that room is pride and the foundation you're building your life on is sinking and you love your comfort more than you love the Messiah and you are an idolater and you lust and you covet and you steal and we worship false gods and we don't honor the Lord on the Lord's day and we take his name in vain. When the Holy Spirit begins to do his great work on all of us, the first thing he's going to do is say, you're not who you think you are. And you dress it up and you show it up. But we all fall short of the standard of God. And therefore, we're all like Peter. We're deniers. We're not real. We fall short. That's what Luke wants us to see. But that's not all he wants us to see. You get this new Peter, the new Peter, that's the second point, and it's in this chapter. And because of the language, because Jesus 
Luke brings up Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas. He brings up a trial. He brings up, they, 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 they summon Peter, and they lock them up for the night, and then they interrogated him the next day that what Luke wants you to do is to say, wait a minute, this is the same scene. It's the same scene from Luke 22, only here it's Peter. It's the same people. It's the servant girl's master that is in front of Peter. It, 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 it's, the, it's the high priest who played a role in Jesus's execution. It's the high priest who sent people. It's the same Peter in front of the same people under the same circumstances. And look, if I'm a betting person and I don't know the rest of the story, you know what I'm betting? I'm betting that Peter, you're going to be Peter. And you're going to do the same thing you did last time. You're going to pick up a weapon and fight your way out of it. You're going to lie and be deceitful. You're going to run away in shame. And did you notice that's not how this chapter reads? It's not how it reads. What got Peter here? It's because he went into the temple in broad daylight, not in hiding. And he performed a miracle. A lame man could not walk, and he was begging Peter for food and for money. And Peter says, I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have is the name of Jesus. In his name be raised. And it's broad daylight, and 5,000 people come to faith. And after Peter does that, the one who was just a liar in Luke 22 is now telling the truth. He says, it's not by my piety. It's not by my power. He is raised because of Jesus. And then it gets Peter locked up and they want to keep Peter from talking. And what does Peter say? He says, look, that that you can't make me not teach. He goes on to say that 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 that. There is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. He's telling the people who just killed Jesus, who have his life in their hands again. He says, there is no other name given among heaven. He says, you killed the author of life and it is not up for us to listen to you. We will keep preaching. And if you read the broader context, Peter gets locked up. He gets freed the next day. And the same Peter who goes to sleep in the garden when Jesus tells him to pray, that same Peter summons the church, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. And that same Peter who went to sleep is now empowered by the spirit. And guess what? He gets up and he keeps preaching and keeps preaching and keeps preaching so much so that he is beat again. And then he rejoices that we were able to suffer for the name. And then when you keep reading, you start to see that the poor, that that the whole church that, that is being birthed right here, that they start to lay their treasures and their fields and the proceeds from the sale of their homes at the feet of the disciples. And then they ration those things out so that the poor are taken care of. And that's profound because yesterday at Jubilee's funeral, I made the case to you that the church never did Jubilee as God commanded in the book of Leviticus. And what you see right here happening in the book of Acts, it's a mini Jubilee of sorts. They begin to take their land and sell it and bring it. They begin to sell their houses and bring it. Do you see what's happening? That these are new people and at the tip of the spear is this new person, this new apostle named Peter. If you were here for the Monday, Thursday service, Brian reminded us we are like Peter. And Jesus dies for those of us who deny him. And you know what Luke wants us to see? That's not the end of the story. The same Peter who denied Jesus rejoiced that he could suffer and be beaten. The same Peter who used his tongue to lie and to try to get out of a situation is the same Peter who looks his potential killers in the eye and says, we will not shut up. The same Peter who was in hiding in the book of Luke is now the same Peter. And here's the thing. We don't always preach that. We assume that because I am who I was, that I will always be who I was. And we look at the world that way. We look at wayward children that way. We look at our spouses that way. We have this 
unhealthy and unbiblical view of sanctification. That we think that we're unchangeable. And we think that the situations we find ourselves in today, that we have to act the same way we acted yesterday and the day before. And the good news of the book of Acts is you don't. We can change. If this Peter was a house on love it or list it, you will walk in there and you say, I love it. I love what you've done to those sagging floors. I love the foundation work that you've done to stabilize this home. I love the new roof. I love the way that you've opened up this room. I love the new countertops. And and this is the same place, and yet it's new. It's, It's different. And that is what the gospel says is true for you. God does not discard the saints. He begins his radical, radical, radical work to transform the saints, and he does it by going into every little nook and cranny of our lives. Yeah, I know lust used to be right there, but I'm going to take it out and make your delight in me. And I know you used to use your tongue to lie and get your way, but I'm going to make you a truth teller. And I know that that you used to be scared of suffering and scared of death, but I'm going to make you look at a casket and rejoice in my name because I've overcome the grave. Do you hear what God is doing through the gospel? And he's locating it in the same people who blaspheme his name. He's doing a work, family. So here's the million dollar question, right? How did it happen? You saw the old Peter, Luke 22. You see this new Peter who is healing folk and is courageous and is truth telling, who is unafraid of persecution, who is rejoicing that he might die for the gospel. Like, like, like what happened? What's the source of his transformation? That's the third point, the source of his transformation. You guys know, you ladies know that whenever we see radical transformation, it's usually followed by investigation. Am I telling the truth or am I telling the truth? You get somebody who lose 60, 70 pounds. Oh, girl, you look good. Oh, dude, you killing it. What's your secrets, partner? (laughs) Right? Ain't that how we work? You get a kid who is not doing well in school, and all of a sudden that, that F is now an A? You're like, what happened, partner? You get someone who's addicted for years and they walk in sobriety and wholeness of heart. We want to know why. We want to know how. Transformation always leads to investigation. And when you investigate, here's what you're going to discover. It's going to be two things, family. And it's not hard. It's going to be one You got some bad news and you came to the end of yourself. And then two, an expert came alongside of you and they helped you. Right? And that's what you see with Peter. Peter blew it. He denied Jesus. He lied to Jesus. And what Luke tells us is they made eye contact. And that's not in there just to say, oh, they saw each other. Jesus saw Peter. And Jesus saw him at his worst. And that Jesus that he betrayed would begin to bear Peter's sin. He would go on a cross. And he would begin to suffer all the judgment that was due Peter. And on the cross was the Jesus who was dying for Peter. Peter saw the bad news. 
But there is good news. The same Jesus who died did not stay dead. He went into the grave, and on the third day, he was raised in power. And that same Jesus went back and found Peter and cooked breakfast for his betrayers. He went to Peter and recommissioned him and summoned him. He said, Peter, receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, that is the gospel. The gospel isn't just that Jesus died for your sins. The gospel is that Jesus died for your sins and he conquered and he was raised victorious. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now resides in all those who bow the knee to the crucified king. It's the resurrection. It's what Paul says when he summons, when he talks about his gospel in 1 Corinthians, he says, I delivered unto you that which was of chief importance, that Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures. And Jesus Christ was buried, and on the third day, he rose according to the scriptures. In other words, for the apostle Paul, it's not just a dead Messiah that is the gospel. The whole gospel is a dead Messiah who died and a risen Messiah who raises you and I to life. And he begins his work by his own spirit to go in and renovate us. What changed Peter? It's the events that happened between his failure and what you see right now. It's resurrection family. Eight times in this section of Acts, from Acts 2 to Acts 6, Peter references the resurrection of Jesus. He says, I'm a witness. The resurrection of Jesus, I'm a witness. The resurrection of Jesus, I'm a witness. He is ascended right now. Right now, he is saving and redeeming. And that's what you see in the passage. Look at verse 2. They were greatly annoyed because he was teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Look at verse 10. Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that same Jesus is now at work ascended at his right hand of God working and healing and transforming for Peter that was colossal we're witnesses we're witnesses we're witnesses we've seen it it's the resurrection family if the cross removed guilt the resurrection brought new life If we have died with Christ, we have been raised to new life in the resurrection. If the cross marked the death of the old man and the old woman, Jesus' resurrection furnishes us with the new spirit, the new spirit of Christ who lives in us. Why the profound change? Who got in and did the makeover on Peter? Who renovated his life while still keeping him the same person? It's the risen king. And did you catch the play on words in chapter three? You don't have to turn there, but it is astonishing that when Peter raised the man who was lame, it says Peter took him by the right hand and Peter raised him. So you have Jesus who's been raised, you have Peter who's been raised, and now you have the raised Messiah who's raising disciples who are now raising other people to life. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, there is no more condemnation, family. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, When you face death and dying, you can do so with hope. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, you do not pray to a dead saint, but to an alive and listening king. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, that is the down payment of the first fruit of all that is to come. He is making all things new. He is raising everything back to life. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we see everything differently now. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we who have been raised are now dead raisers. We look out into this world and we want people to live. 
We look out into this world and we want to see resurrection. We look out into this world and we want to be agents of change who celebrate the majesties and the glories of Jesus. Beloved, the resurrection of Jesus changed this man. And when we ponder that and lean into that and believe that and have that worked in our souls, beloved, he changes you. You are free. You've been set free, free to love, free to die, free to be patient, free to be chaste, free to be merciful, free to stare death in its face, free to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, free to truth tell, free to know and delight in the riches of the Lord. We're free. I'm going to close with this quote by N.T. Wright, and it's in your bulletin. It's from his book, Surprised by Hope. He nails resurrection theology for me in ways that others don't. But here's what he writes. Jesus is risen. Therefore, God's new world has begun. Jesus is risen. Therefore, Israel and the world have been redeemed. Jesus is risen. Therefore, his followers have a job to do. And what is the new job? To bring the life of heaven to birth in actual, physical, earthly reality. The bodily resurrection of Jesus is more than a proof that God performs miracles or that the Bible is true. It is much, much more than the assurance of heaven after death. Paul speaks of going going away and being with Jesus, but his main emphasis is on coming back again in a risen body to live in God's newborn creation. Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize the earth with the life of heaven. That, after all, is what the Lord's prayer is about. The resurrection is indeed the foundation of for a renewed way of life and living in the world. May that be so for us all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that we were like Peter. And in some senses, we are still like the old Peter to the degree that we feed the old man. But Lord, we are new and we are different We are yours, and we thank you, Lord, that all praise and honor is not unto us, but it's unto you, the great restorer of your people, the great renovator of your people, the great changer of your people. Father, I pray by your spirit that we will, as Paul writes, that we will experience the same power of God that raised Christ from the dead in the person of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, who conforms us, who keeps us. Father, I pray for those who might not know you today. I pray that today might be a day, Lord, where they're tired. They're tired of their old ways. They're tired of the deeds of darkness. I pray that you put a mirror in front of them and let them see themselves as you do, deeply in need of someone else to rescue. And I pray, Lord, that that would lead them to the cross and see a Messiah who died for them and that they would see that the same Messiah who died is the one who has raised, was raised and is himself raising us. Pour out your spirit on your people, I pray, afresh and anew. In Jesus' name, amen.